Today I'm reacting to Dr. Mike's watch collection. And let me tell you, there's some belters in there. This is gonna be fireworks. Before we get into the video, make sure you subscribe to the channel now. And if you wanna buy or sell your watch, brideandpinion.com right now, no discussion. After the last video we posted about TikTokers, every one of you commented Dr. Mike. You ask, I deliver. That's how this relationship works. This color blue has a little bit of meaning to me as well. My mom had very striking blue eyes. And I knew my dad was gonna be in a dark place and we always talked about getting a dog. That 14 second piece went uh, left, right, left dog. It's a wee bit of a emotional uh, roller coaster of those 14 seconds. And I said, I think now's the moment. I wanna surprise my father with a dog. I got a Siberian Husky with the exact same color eye. Beautiful dog. I love dogs. Dogs are better than humans. Every year I try to donate a lot of money, food and all sorts of things to several dog sanctuaries across Northern Ireland. You know that when you watch our live streams. I haven't done a live stream in a long time. Maybe we need to get back to that. The, the Siberian Husky became a part of our family. Yeah. And we felt like a part of my mom's spirit was within her. I love stories, watches, and stories, watches carry stories. The reason why we wear watches is of course completely different with every single person. Although I'm very fortunate to have still have both my parents, although they're both not very well, unfortunately, whenever one of my parents passes away, I will inherit a watch and that watch will carry the story of my father. In this case, he attaches a story to a watch that relates to his mother. I like that, I think that that is amazing. And I think there's not many objects in the world where you can create that emotional connection. I love stories, I love watches, I love dogs. That's amazing for all the videos that you've made. Yeah. Uh, we, we've seen the watches on your wrist, but you've never spoken about them. Exactly, so they've been there, they're part of the background, but now it's time to hear the background story. For those in our audience who... <laughs> you see that Defy, Defy Extreme, that black thing. I have a story about that watch, and let me tell you, let me show you, by the way. That watch helped me kickstart Pride and Pinion. Yeah, I genuinely. A good friend of mine had that watch. I don't know what he paid for it, like insane money. And I was like, why the hell did you buy that? This watch, as ugly as it is, because let me be very clear, looks horrendous. There's several variations of that watch, by the way. They're made in titanium, but that watch helped me kickstart Pride and Pinion. That's one of the first watches I got in stock. It took me about two years to sell it. One of those stars, you see the stars on the, on the bezel, actually fell off and Zenith quoted me. I think it was two and a half thousand pounds to replace one of those stars and they weren't made of precious metal. It was an absolute disgrace. The reason why, and I actually have a photo, is because they didn't have those bezels in production anymore. So I had to make one specifically. So we go back to the history, this is 2018 and I started the business in 2017. Here you see the star missing. This is from a Zenith era when Cherry Natoff was the CEO, a very flamboyant character, an absolute character for sure. He uh, made some questionable choices as well as that. You see the Zenith El Premier on the left. Now I sold that watch too, and I have a photo of that as well. So this is quite cool. And on the right, you see a copy of a Rolex Daytona. But let me explain, right? There's only one brand that is allowed to copy that watch, and that's Zenith, because there's a big history with Zenith, an interesting history which we never really discussed. Zenith with the El Primero is responsible for the first fully integrated chronograph ever created. Let me explain what that means. Normal chronographs back in the day were based on a module, time module and a chronograph modules being built on that. That was a chronograph in pocket watches and in some older watches. Zenith was the first one ever to build a fully in-house integrated chronograph that was built as a chronograph and that is called the El Primero. Zenith was arguably the first, right? Some people say Bretling, some people say Hoyer. I know that Bretling worked together with Zenith back in the day. As well as that, Zenith fought a lot of adversity because in the early 70s, Zenith was gone. They were bankrupt. The owners of Zenith wanted to sell off the entire company, everything inside the company, including all the tools that made the El Primero. Because the El Primero was the first ever integrated chronograph, these tools were made, specifically made, to produce that movement and that watch specifically. So the owners of Zenith said, sell everything. Charles Fremont, who ran Zenith, done something quite sneaky. He hid 
all the tooling and all the tools to make the El Primero. He hit that in the attic and that action of Charles Fremont hiding all those tools was the savior of the name Zenith and of course the El Primero. Zenith was revived in the 80s and of course became massively mainstream when they helped Rolex with the production of the Daytona in 1986. Before we get into the next one, new drop IFL watches. Time is money. Incredibly hand-painted citizen called Time is Money and some Japanese name which I cannot pronounce. Can you put it on the screen now? Sayosa. Full automatic Japanese movement. A fully hand-painted dial. An absolute belter. And of course, because they're completely hand-painted, every single watch is kind of unique. The new drop by IFL is limited to 150 pieces. And if you've seen other drops, they often sell out. So do make sure you don't miss out if you want something cool and unique and something to talk about. Because people will talk about this. First link in the description. And thank you so much, IFL, for supporting me and the channel once again. I also manage one of the biggest medical platforms in the world these days, kind of surreal to say, but across social media, we have almost 25 million subscribers. What an incredible guy and what an incredible achievement. I know how hard it is to be in front of the camera. I know how hard it is to make a name for yourself in any industry, but the medical industry must be extremely ridiculously complicated, but what an achievement. And it started off with my father buying me um, a high school present of a Seiko Kinetic watch. Mm -hmm. I think I remember the model. It was a Seiko Arctura. Okay. So like this is like an older, old. That's cool. Then you're fucking 16 years old, baller with a watch. Fucking love that. He had a Zenith watch that's actually here today, the El Primero. And I would always take this from him to wear out with my friend. That open heart where you can see that high beat frequency movement. You see the, the balance wheel is really cool. This is old school, I enjoy that. So where does it go from this Zenith in your sort of collecting path? My first probably high-end watch purchase was my stainless steel Royal Oak chronograph there. It's a boutique only 26331 ST. Boutique only, I mean, this watch was only available directly at the AP boutique. So not from, for example, authorized dealers. After this era, AP closed down all the authorized dealers and supplied only their own boutiques with watches. I think the Giorgenta design of the Royal Oak is the most beautiful design ever created in a watch. I think this is the perfect watch with the perfect bracelet. The Steel Sports Watch, introduced in 1972. This was in an era where the quartz crisis nearly destroyed 40% of the Swiss watchmakers, including Zenith. AP was the first one to really do it differently and it brought out a Steel Sports Watch, which was more expensive than a gold watch that they normally produced. This one in particular is very special. And that's not just talking about the Royal Oak, because as you can see, I I'm can also see. Um, a code 1159 fan here. I think this is a, a watch that looks very different in real life than it does in a photograph. Code 1159, let me put it out there. The CEO of AP left there last year, but worked for AP for about 20 years. This is his brainchild, Code 1159. It was launched in 2019. And when it was launched, like every other watch, like an Aquanaut or any other brand that introduced their watch, they get a lot of sh Oh, it looks like a standard Seiko. Oh, it looks like this. Honestly, you can never do it right when you launch a watch. But it shows balls, it shows courage, and it shows vision for the future. I would say that the Code 1159 is today very well received. I know a lot of people that own a Code 1159 and not because they had to go on the AP journey to buy a Royal Oak. No, they specifically went in to buy a Code 1159. I love it. I'm a big fan. It's, it's one of the coolest watches out there. And to be completely honest, we don't really give the previous CEO the credits today. He brought AP to where it is today. He made AP mainstream. And while he was making AP mainstream, he brought the entire watch industry with him. I also see another Zenith here uh, and it happens to have the high beat movement just like flying around yes. the dial. How does the Zenith enter the collection? Uh, I, I love Zenith. I think that their designs are just so clean. Uh, also, the fact that it has the high beat movement, I mean, one one hundredths of a second yep. on a mechanical. You can't measure one hundredths of a second with that movement, by the way. It's one tenth of a second. 36,000 beats movement means it's a five hertz movement. It allows you to measure time more accurately. One tenth of a second. And it was actually Francois Paul Jouren that brought one of his watches to one hundredth of a second. But the cool part of this watch, of course, it resembles the Daytona, but there's only one brand. And I said this before and I will say this again, there's only one brand that's allowed to do that for me. 
and that's of course Zenith with the history, how they helped the Rolex Daytona in 1986. Yeah, I, I remember wearing this watch and the reason I remember wearing, you know, uh, it's a really nice watch. I like it, 5968A, steel chronograph, orange hand, orange strap. On the secondary market, it goes for $150,000. Let me point this out. Do not buy that watch at $150,000. It's not worth $150,000. You can buy so many insane watches for that money. It's crazy. It's a lovely watch, but the strap doesn't make it valuable. A normal Aquanaut, you would be able to buy from about $40,000 upwards. Say with a chronograph, 70, 80, $90,000. Save yourself a good chunk of money and buy another watch with that. Give to the Patek watches in that they probably wear the most comfortable out of all the watches. It's a funny thing, right? When the Aquanaut was introduced in 1997, it wasn't well received because Patek Philippe is a very formal watch brand making highly complicated watches on leather straps and one sports watch with a bracelet, in this case, the 3700. How the hell are they making watches with rubber straps nowadays? It took about 20 years for this watch to properly find its place. And the same is, of course, with Code 1159. It becomes more popular, but it will take another five to 10 years to really become mainstream. This is like when you know you're deep, for sure. <laughs> yeah, this for is like not just perpetual calendar, but it's like ceramic perpetual calendar. Two, six, five, seven, nine. Unbelievable watch that, lads. Doctors get f***ing seriously paid in America, lad. That's ridiculous. What's the story behind it? You know, what memories are baked into it? That's, uh, that's the 10 million watch. Yeah. That's the watch that f***ing hell. 10 million subscribers buys that watch. Jesus, that's an achievement. Black on YouTube. Both, by the way, that watch and the 10 millions. Uh, I was at an event with Chris Hemsworth, and he was also wearing an Odd Mars at the time. Yeah. And he's like, dude. And I'm like, yeah, well, dude. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's funny, right? I, I recognize that a lot. Watches connect people, and it doesn't matter if you're bottom of the barrel fucking idiot that wears a Rolex, and someone big time wears a Rolex as well. For some reason, us men are connected with our watches. Like, oh, you have a Daytona too, and that is a point to talk about. This is why a lot of people say, when you wear a nice watch in meetings or a nice watch on dinner, it is a point to talk about. That is something so underrated. It's incredible. Like, if I see someone wearing a crazy watch. I want to speak with that person. I want to know the story of that watch. That's what I do very often. I come to Times Square and I showed him where the ball drops, where we came in 1995 and we saw that ball drop because we came in December 1995 and then saw the ball drop. His son is on that building. It's amazing. But the surprise wasn't over. Right. We then took an Uber, he not knowing where he's going, uh, to the Audemars store not too far away. And uh, I surprised him with his very own Royal Oak chronograph. Wow. And uh, very similar to mine here, but with uh, a silver face. Here, that's a bit tricky. I love that watch, right? He's wearing a fucking belt of a watch. He bought that at AP, right? This photo of this watch just gives me a lot of questions. That date wheel is wrong. If I look at this, this is supposed to be a 26240, right? Let me see a photo here. 26240, white dial. That three is not straight in the case. It doesn't matter which angle it is photographed. It's not in the middle. It's not filling the all. It, there's something wrong there with that three. Like that's wrong. Next to that, that's a wrong type of three because they use a different font for that. But I'm just looking at this, right? And I'm just gonna stand up. And the date wheel of AP is always pitch perfect. Always fills in exactly. So so the date, I don't know what I'm doing here. The exact date, the number is always exactly filled in that square. So it's not because it's just past 12. 13 has just come down. It's I like where you're going with that because you're saying maybe just past 12 because then this watch kind of needs a service. What you're saying is correct, right? But that wouldn't apply to this. And if I look at the number three, it's completely different with that three. Look at that. I'm not going to say that this is a fake watch, but I'm going to say if I saw this on a forum and someone asked me if this is real or fake, I would have said, yeah, this is fake. Look at the date. I don't know what this is. I would love to know, but I have my concerns about this. Let me tell you one thing. All the watches of Dr. Mike are legit. Where does he live? New York? Let's see if we can get him in front of the camera. I would love to learn more about this. Here's the watch of Dr. Mike. Here's a normal one. Do you see what I see? Am I getting crazy? If it was any other person other than Dr. Mike, I would consider it fake, but I would highly doubt it is. So there's something here and I would love to understand how, why, and what's going on.